Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. Um, we are super excited to be here in Boone, North Carolina, joined by Congresswoman Virginia Fox, who represents this part of the state. Um, I'm thrilled to be down here in the Tar Heel State. As we'll get into, she's actually my former boss on Capitol Hill, um, but we're thrilled to have this conversation to uh, hopefully not introduce you for the first time, but get to know a little bit better someone who's been a champion of a lot of our issues at Americans for Prosperity, is taking on enormous challenges with a lot of entrenched establishment uh, throughout the range of issues. And so we're excited to dive into her background and some of those issues. So Dr. Fox, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Kosh. Let's make it clear to the viewers that you didn't leave uh, you, we didn't want you to leave, right? We, we cried when you left, just so everybody knows. You, you worked uh, for the uh, Ed and Workforce Committee, and we were delighted to have you. Thank you. No, it was a great experience, and it's good to be back at Americans for Prosperity and obviously working closely with Dr. Fox's office. So as we dive into it, tell us a little bit about yourself, your background prior to Congress, your upbringing, and, and kind of how you got here. Akash, I grew up not far from here in the mountains of North Carolina, very, very poor, house with no electricity, no running water. So did my husband. Uh, his parents were totally illiterate. My mother and father had uh, high school, my mother had a sixth grade education, my father a ninth grade education. So I come from absolutely no privilege whatsoever, just dirt poor. But both my husband and I were encouraged in school and I by my parents, not he by his parents because his father died when he was 10 and his mother really could not encourage him to go to college. But we both had an opportunity to go to college, worked our way through and uh, always knew there were two things that can make you successful in this country, the freest country in the world. And that is learning skills, getting a good education and hard work. And so that's what we've done all our lives. And fortunately for us, we've been able to live in this area. And we live two-tenths of a mile from where my husband grew up and 12 miles from where I grew up. We love it here. But again, our roots are here, but also our values are very, very strong from this area. We, again, don't go into debt, work hard. This is the greatest country in the world. It will give you every opportunity you're willing to take hold of. And so both of us did that. And that's our philosophy. And that's what I talk to other people about. There's no country in the world where two people like we were could grow up and be a success. We're not enormously wealthy or anything, but we've used our talents to, on behalf of other people. Yeah, that's fantastic. And you know, I've been fortunate enough to tell some of the activists with AFP a similar background my dad had growing up in India. Um, you know, he lost his dad when he was very young. And from a young age, you know, in other countries, you think of America as the only place where the circumstances of your birth don't determine the circumstances exactly. of your life. And that's kind of, you know, what brought him here and obviously what, what you're a testament of as well. So tell us about your, your work background, your professional background. You have a background both in business and education, which obviously applies to your work in Congress. I do. Uh, my senior year in high school, I was the high school janitor. I had a student teacher in English, so he encouraged me to go to college, and I decided I'd be a high school English teacher. Um, but that didn't work out, so I got my master's in college teaching and in sociology. I was, our, I was a round peg in a square hole early on, uh, so I got a job at Appalachian teaching, then I worked on my doc, I got, I got a master's degree, then I worked on my doctorate while I was working full-time at Appalachian. It took me seven years to get my undergraduate degree, seven years to get my master's, I mean my doctorate. Uh, so I was in education. That's where I thought I'd make my life. I became the president of a community college. But at the same time, my husband was having to work away from home, and so we started a nursery and a landscaping business. We didn't have any capital. Tom says all you need for a, a nursery business landscaping is a shovel and a pickup. And so we did it the hard way again, but we ran a successful nursery landscaping business for 35 years. So you're right, I've, I've led two lives, the private sector and the public sector. I've always been fascinated by education though and what it can do to people. I ran for this, after being a community college president, I ran for the state senate, then for Congress, 
and I've been there now uh, almost 18 years. Yeah, that's fantastic. So tell us a little bit, you were mentioning this area. Tell us about your district, your constituents. What's it like out here? I mean, the industry and the people, who is it that you really represent? Well, this is the greatest place in the world, my opinion. I, unfortunately, too many people have discovered it. So we've got a lot of people <laughs> coming from New York and Florida. Now, if they want to come and adjust to our values, that's wonderful, but please don't bring your California, New York values here. But these are hardworking people, Akash. They always have been. Mountaineers have always been known as fiercely independent and hardworking. We don't have a lot of major industry. And I do represent most of the mountains of North Carolina, the high mountains. We actually have the highest mountains east of the Rockies, and most people don't realize that. So very cold in the winter, but I go down to the Piedmont. I have uh, Forsyth County where Wake Forest University is, Baptist Hospital. So it's an eclectic background, a lot of farming. Again, not a whole lot of industry, but it's an area where people are beginning to look to uh, learning on remote, how they can work remotely. So they're smart people, and I always give them lots of credit. Lots of skilled craftspeople here. Uh, they've had to be. Over the years, this was a tough place to live, and so you had to be very resourceful to be able to survive. But I love this area, and I, you know, Frankly, if I never went out of my driveway again, it'd be okay. But I sacrificed to go to D.C. You certainly, certainly do, and we appreciate that. So why did you want to run for office? First for, the, first for the state legislature and then for Congress. What drove you to run in the first place and then ultimately to run for Congress and be there as long as you have? Well, right after we moved back to Watauga County, I was attending school board meetings as an observer for the League of Women Voters. And one night, the school board was being particularly incompetent. I mean, they were bad. And uh, somebody sitting next to me said, why don't you run for the school board? I said, no, no, I'm not qualified. He said, you mean you're not as qualified as those turkeys are? And I said, well, I guess I am. I had my master's degree. I had a child in the public school. I went home and told my husband. I said, Ron Hester thinks I should run for the school board. He said, I think that's a good idea. So. I ran, um, and I lost the first time I ran. But then I ran again in two years, and I was the top vote getter. And so basically, again, education pulled me into running for office. But Akash, I know the people in Americans for Prosperity, many of your grassroots people don't think they're capable of serving in public office, but all you need is a lot of common sense. And I have that in abundance. And so, I encourage others because many people will say their first reaction is, I'm not qualified. Yeah. And that's true for women especially. Women think they need to know everything before they get into a job. And I think it's still true. So that's how I got in. School board 12 years, community college president, and then um, state senate, and then Congress. But I've always been driven by service to others and doing what I could to help people learn again what makes this country great and how they can use their talents to make the country great. Mm -hmm. So ultimately getting to Congress, I mean, that's a big step from serving at the local level or it even was. the state level. So, so what drove you to do that and what's kept you there as kind of a driving force? Well, the thing that got me going was there was an open seat. <laughs> that helps a mm -hmm. lot. Richard Burr got elected the to Congress in 1994, the same year I got elected to the uh, state Senate. And so we had overlapping districts. His district was twice as large as mine. In those days, the Democrats in North Carolina had gerrymandered the districts to have double member Senate districts. So I was representing over 300,000 people in my Senate district, half the size of a congressional district. But in uh, 2003, he announced he would run for the U.S. Senate. And so the seat was open and people encouraged me to run. My husband was interested in my running. He said, you know, you work really hard at the state level, run for Congress. I, serious, I think seriously he was hoping I'd lose. <laughs> so then I'd come home and work for him. Uh, but I won. I, there was a 12-person primary and we had a runoff. Um, and I was outspent seven to one. Wow. So uh, I think God wants me to be here, mm -hmm. be in Congress. Yeah, absolutely. And you've done fantastic work. So 
One of the things that, you know, I, I picked up very quickly on the Hill was um, you're very well respected, you know, not only through your Republican colleagues, but even your counterpart on the Democratic side on the committee, Bobby Scott, for being, you know, ruthless and tough, but fair, ultimately. So what do you think sort of creates that, that aura about you? What is it about your work in Congress or your relationships with other members of Congress that has kind of, you know, helped you build those relationships? I hope I'm not ruthless, <laughs> but I, I do have drive. You know, I'm very honest with everybody, Akash. I'm very straightforward. I don't have a hidden agenda. I'm straight up with people. Uh, I tell them what I'm about, and then I go about trying to get it done. I think people know that I am very determined to do the right things, and I work at it. And, and I hope that gives me a respect. I am fair. I do believe that I'm very fair with people. Uh, when we were in the majority and I presided, the Democrats and Republicans both loved it because I was treated everybody very fairly. Um, on the committee, I try to do my homework. And as you know from your work on the committee, we have a fabulous staff. And uh, we're trying to do good things for the American people. Yep. yep, absolutely. And I thought there's, and we'll get into it, there's plenty of areas of disagreement between the two sides, but there are opportunities for collaboration. and. I know that that's something you take very seriously. Absolutely, and you know, the major bills that I've gotten passed always have been uh, bipartisan. You have to work to find compromise. I will never compromise my principles. Yeah. And, I, I, and, and the staff understands that, so as they help me negotiate things, we don't ever compromise my principles, or their principles either for that matter, but we will find ways to get things done. I know, I am not the queen of the world. Uh, it can't be all my way. Mm -hmm. I think I have the right answers all the time, but, but I also know I'm in a body of 435 people. Well, let's dive into the issues, Dr. Fox. Um, you know, you look at every poll, every indicator, the number one issue by far, understandably on people's minds right now, is inflation, jobs, the economy. Um, inflation is through the roof right now. The average American family is spending more than $5,200 more this year than they were last year for the same quality of life. Real compensation has gone down because even as wages have risen, inflation has risen faster. We know largely this is being driven by bad policy from the federal government, overspending, overregulation, and so on. What are you hearing from your constituents here in this area about the economy right now? They're so frustrated. They really are. They go to get gas in their cars. They go to the grocery store. I mean, I go to the grocery store and I look at the prices in the grocery store, particularly for meat. Uh, and I think, how in the world is an average family with two or three kids affording this when meat has doubled in its prices? I mean, if you go to buy hamburger, mm -hmm. it's doubled yeah. in its prices. Uh, and it's, it's tough. But the public is very, very disappointed. They want us to do something, but I try to explain to them elections have consequences, and unfortunately, it's going to be difficult to do anything uh, with the policies coming out of the Biden administration. But I agree with you. It's overregulation. If you look back at the Trump years, and this is not really political in a sense, but if you just look, the, we diminished the number of regulations. And I think that has as much to do with what happened, and the president would say that over and over again, mm -hmm. as tax cuts did. And we, yes, we spent a little bit more, but that's because of factors sometimes outside the control of the Congress in terms of spending, like with Medicare, Medicaid, things that are on automatic pilot, as, as you mm -hmm. guys are very familiar with. But I think we had a wonderful economy just before COVID hit. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. And one of the things about the economy kind of pre-election was that wages were actually rising faster for people at the bottom rungs than they were at Correct. the top. And that's because Correct. the cost of regulation so often is borne by people with lower incomes when it comes to higher gas and electricity prices Correct. and things like that. Yeah. So, you know, one of the, the major policy drivers of inflation was the American Rescue Plan, as President Biden called it, yeah. which you thankfully voted against, as did all of your Republican colleagues. Yes. Um, you mentioned regulations, but these things are kind of hard for, for average folks to really understand. When people are, are stopping you on the street in the district, like, how are you really explaining to them the connection between the policies and the cost of living going up? 
Well, I will tell you, uh, last year in the grocery store, the grocery store I go to most of the time, when those checks were coming out to people, and, and one of the butchers said to me, well, when's our next check going to come out? I said, well, I'm telling you, you're going to get another check, but you're going to see it when the gas prices and the food prices go up. You're going to be really, really sorry mm -hmm. that you are looking for those checks to come to you. And that's what I've explained to people, is when the government goes so much into debt, as it has, and it takes money out of the private sector, which it has done, then there's less money in the private sector to create more productivity and to improve the economy. The government never improves the economy. The government always makes it worse. And it, it again, people will understand that if you explain it in, in just very common layman's terms. You know, how long can you keep spending more than you're bringing in? Uh, not long, they say to yeah. me. I mean, no. how many months can you spend more than what you've got? Not long. And then the bank's going to shut you down. And so people get it if you put it in simple terms. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, one of the great ironies is despite his poll numbers falling and the inflation numbers going up, President Biden is still pushing for another partisan trillion dollar spending bill. And they're trying to figure out what's going to be in it and what, you know, tax giveaways and, and welfare programs and things like that. So, you know, what do you see the future outlook and what are you telling people that, you know, even if some of these things might sound good on their face, what the impact might be if, you know, Pelosi, Schumer and Biden get another trillion dollar partisan, partisan spending bill through Congress before the end of the year? Well, I will just make the connection for them. But you're absolutely right. They seem to be in a vacuum of some sort, particularly the president, because every time he speaks, he says, oh, to improve the economy, we have to spend more, spend more, spend more. Uh, it, it's just mind boggling to me, and I think mind boggling to other people, that they seem to be so disconnected from reality. And uh, I'll just keep explaining it to people that that's the wrong way to go. Yeah, absolutely. And, and last thought on this, one of the things I think as consumers, we see gas prices on the side of the road, um, you know, but unless we're really looking at price tags at, you know, in the grocery store, things like that, we might not actually even know what's coming down the pike as far as what employers are dealing with. Now, when it comes to industry, agriculture, shipping, transportation, manufacturing costs, I mean, what are you hearing? What is it that, that normal folks might not be aware of that they're not seeing on the side of the road when it comes to cost increases? Well, people can't buy fertilizer. I mean, again, I live in an area where there's a lot of farming going on, and a lot of people just have their own gardens, and they see that the cost of fertilizer's gone up, or they couldn't get seed potatoes this year. I went to a couple of uh, hardware stores. We, have a, we, we grow a small garden every year. We grew up that way, and we still do it. And you can't, you can't find seeds anywhere. And when you explain to people that's part of the supply chain because people have cut back, they lost a lot of employees. So you, you have to show them the domino effect mm -hmm. of what has happened in the last two, almost two years now. And they begin again to get the idea. I think most people have caught on to the fact that the gas prices and the diesel prices have really hurt the supply chain yep. a lot. But as they understand too, how much money, how much petroleum products, how many petroleum products are in so many of the things that we get. And corn, for example, and you know, they've just increased, or I heard something about how they're letting ethanol be at a higher level than it was going to be. Mm -hmm. So that's gonna reduce the amount of corn oil that's available for other products, which is gonna drive up the cost. Now, the president is right that what's happened in Ukraine has had some impact, obviously, and, and people have learned a lesson about that. Sunflower seed oil, for example, most of it comes from um, Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So people are beginning, I think, to have their eyes opened. Yeah, absolutely. And, and one more thought on the economy kind of in general is this labor shortage, right? This is something that, you know, when the economy was strong, we were seeing people coming off the sidelines, getting back to work, right. getting that kind of dignity of work that you talked about is so strong in right. this area. But now, no matter where you are in the country, you see hiring signs everywhere. And it's actually causing an impact on the economy because productivity is slower and, you know, people are waiting longer to get jobs done right. and things like that. I mean, what are some of the causes there and how is policy making that worse and or what can policy do to help? 
Well, there is some way that people have gotten onto federal government programs that, is pay that are paying them not to work. And I think that's the real key to it. Um, they, they were able, I think, during the COVID to uh, get onto Medicaid, uh, and th that program is a, a door opener for other programs, and somehow or another they're still being able to get those programs. And for some reason, I think people's, um, people's drive to succeed and to work got diminished during COVID when they st so many stayed home for so long. Mm -hmm. It really changed the culture of our country. And I'm truly worried about how we're gonna bring that back, Akash. Yeah, you touched on something that I think really applies across whether it's spending or it's labor shortage or whatever the case might be. And, and that's the government so often makes things worse. And so the first principle is do no harm, right? When exactly. it comes to Congress and right now, the president's agenda, whether it's more spending, more regulations on energy, more programs that are going to push people to the sidelines, um, it really is going to be more harm rather than any real solution. So um, hopefully we're, we're headed towards a better direction for next year. Little example. I was reading an article in the Wall Street Journal the other day about how the housing issue, how this is a big issue in my district and it's a big issue most places quote, affordable housing. Mm -hmm. What is affordable housing? So there's an article in there about employers, a lot of employers, uh, one of which is, is in the, um, the Winston-Salem area, uh, Cook Medical, but their headquarters is in Indiana. The president of the company decided to invest in building some affordable housing as kind of a transition for people, give them a, an affordable place to rent till they could get on their feet and buy. And I, I sent him a copy of the article and I said, another example of government screwing up and the private sector saving the government because that, the cost of, of building is so high. Part of that's local regulations, mm -hmm. part of it's state regulations, but a lot of it is tariffs mm -hmm. and other things that drive up the cost of products and companies shutting down during COVID. There's a lot, it's very complicated, but it's impacting everybody. Absolutely. So moving on to another issue, one that's near and dear to my heart, one that we worked on together, and that's labor. Um, right. You've been rock solid on this issue for years. We're both proponents of what we like to call worker freedom. Why is that exactly. a value that's important to you? And, and is that something that's reflected here in North Carolina? Or, or why, why is that something you're passionate about? Well, I have to say that my father uh, got me started on this a long time ago. We moved to North Carolina when I was six and a half and there was really no places to work. My father actually had gone to school on the GI Bill and become a cosmetologist. But in the 50s, there was absolutely, you couldn't make a living. So he had to work away from home most of the time. And he, by default, went back to New York where he had grown up and lived with my grandparents for a while and worked. And he was forced to join unions. And he hated it because my father, I, I take after my father in the fact that I work hard. I get up, I know I have a job to do, I do it. So that's the way he was. He wanted to do his work. He didn't want to be forced to take a break. He didn't want to be forced to slow down and do those kinds of things. So I heard those stories from him. But again, I'm just a huge freedom person. I want people to have the right to work where they want to work without anybody else telling them how to do their job. Unless, of course, they're getting advice to do something safely. But um, I, so I grew up with that with my father and obviously grew up in North Carolina, which is a right to work state. Didn't think too much about it. Uh, but um, as, I, as I worked in the, in the ledge, well, as I was in charge of um, hiring people at Appalachian State University when I was an assistant dean there, and then throughout my entire work life was exposed to hiring people not very often firing people, but sometimes having to do that. And so I learned that, but I've understood um, that the unions, maybe in the 30s there was a need for them, but not anymore. Mm -hmm. We have so many laws now to protect workers, and we should have. People should be protected in our country from abusive people. There's no question about that. But the unions have gone overboard. and. I contend that they really don't help the workers 
and we have too many examples of union bosses being corrupt. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's been in the entire union program from the beginning of the unions. You know, that saying power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. You just have the tendency for that to happen mm -hmm. in the unions. And we, we don't need them anymore, in my opinion. Yeah. So I'm a big proponent of right to work and a big proponent of people having their freedom, where to work, when to work, be able to make choices. Yeah, and that's, that's even more prevalent now, not just in the 21st century, but even post-COVID, right? You've seen this huge growth of independent contracting and flexible Absolutely. work and freelancing and all this. So those are obviously antithetical to kind of that one-size-fits-all labor model. Um, how do you think that that's going to change the debate over unions when people that frankly don't pay attention to labor laws or even politics and policy, they have the potential to be impacted by something like California's AB5 going federal, right. things like that. I mean, have you heard from people or is that something you're particularly worried about? I'm very worried about it. I don't think that has gotten down as much to the independent workers. Again, where, where I live and most of the counties that I serve, we have entrepreneurial people thousands and thousands of jobs out there for people or businesses out there, and they're doing their job. The, we're again known as a place where independent people are. But I think you will see uh, very bad reactions from people if they're being told they have to join a union, they have to pay money, mm -hmm. uh, they're forced to do certain things, and they can't do other kinds of things. That's just not going to work. And I, I'm a huge proponent of, again, independent contractors. Again, we ran a little nursery and a garden center. And now we had to abide by certain laws, obviously, and we were happy to do that. But, but we weren't being forced by a union to do certain things. Yeah, yeah. President Biden makes no secret about the fact that he yeah. calls himself, you know, the most pro-union president ever. Um, but, you know, as you alluded to, being pro-union too often means being pro-union boss, pro-union exactly leadership right. than pro-worker. One of the things right. that, you know, I'm sure you and, and your staff saw on the committee, but folks might not have noticed, is the last administration advanced some union transparency rules. So workers who are members of a union and pay dues, they can see how those dues are being spent, which is particularly important in light of a lot of these union corruption scandals and things right. like that. The Biden administration rolled those back on a Friday afternoon before a holiday during the Christmas New Year season. Um, and just one example of the way that, you know, he's really looking out for the interests of union leadership more so than workers. And so how would you describe what that difference really is for folks that might hear what the president is saying? Well, again, um, the president owes his position to the unions at all levels, teachers unions, uh, all of them, but particularly the teachers unions. And what they want to do is control this country. They want to turn us into a European style country where the unions control everything. And we have to get people to understand that is not the way to go. We do need transparency. Uh, you know, that's one of the big things I talk about all the time, whether it's in education or it's in labor law or what it is. The public needs to understand what the government is doing to it because most of the time it's doing something to the public. And so we need transparency and we need accountability. And when the unions are in control, you don't have accountability, you don't have transparency. And what the Biden administration has done to promote the unions is, is almost criminal, in my opinion. And furthermore, we are now bailing out the union pension funds. So average taxpayers who have no pensions of their own are bailing out the union pension funds because they don't put enough money into the union pension funds. And again, the union bosses are riding high on the dues the members paid. Yep, exactly. So House Democrats have now twice passed the so-called PRO Act, the Protecting the Right to Organize Act. And this bill is, it's almost like every bad idea in labor law, all kind Absolutely. of rolled into one package. Um, it would ban state right to work laws. It would undermine secret ballots. It would require employers to provide employees private personal contact information to union organizers without employees having any say in the matter. Um, you and I have both obviously worked against yeah. the PRO Act. 
um, Americans for Prosperity is supporting an alternative called the Employee Rights Act, which kind of like we alluded to, really defends the rights of employees within and against their union leadership, the right to a secret ballot in a union election, the right for states to keep their right to work laws, the right for employees to decide how to share their own information, pretty common sense stuff. So, you know, why, why are these concepts important? And I think particularly a lot of our activists are in right to work states where labor might not be heavily present, uh, but, but why are these concepts of worker protections and independent contracting, right to work, why are they important even if you're in a conservative state with low union presence? Well, if you, you look at the history of this country, what has made the country great? It, it's those people who are the entrepreneurs, the creative people, left alone, they will, will find a solution to a problem. I've said this over and over again, and in fact, Saturday I was at a, a farmer's market, and there was a man there who created uh, a thing to put on your fishing pole to let the uh, fishing line go out a lot more smoothly than it does normally. And I was just taken by what an ingenious device this was. And I said to him, you know, Americans will always be the most innovative people in the world because we are free. The Chinese will copy us in a heartbeat, but they will never be the entrepreneurs. And it's all based on freedom. And once you force people into unions or you force them to do lots of other things, give up their guns and other things, you've taken away what's made this country great, which is our freedom. Yep, that's exactly right. And speaking from personal experience, I was born and raised in Rhode Island, which obviously heavily union state yeah. and the economy has suffered quite a bit. And you, you alluded to even th this area, you know, Western North Carolina is seeing people move from New York and things like that. And there are a lot of issues at play, but there's, you know, one of the major reasons people from California are moving to Texas and Arizona, people from New York are moving to North Carolina right. and Florida is this, you know, this right to work freedom. So something that's very valuable that AFP has fought for for a long time. Absolutely, and if you look at the states that are prospering, look at North Carolina, look at all these states that are right to work to states, the economies are booming, absolutely booming. And look at where states picked up members of Congress last time, yep. it's in the right to work states. Yep, exactly. Well, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon, oh, Dr. Oh, it's Fox. been a delight. This has been fantastic. I think, you know, you've worked with Americans for Prosperity for a long time. We've been active in North Carolina for almost two decades now, which is incredible yeah. to think. One of the first state chapters that this organization founded. What, what words of encouragement do you have for our activists and what difference they have the potential to make at the local, state, and at the federal level? AFP has always made a difference. Uh, I've been in Congress now 18 years, and you're right. The, I had AFP people coming to see me. Busloads of people would come up once a year to D.C. I would meet with them in the district, too. But they always gave me the perspective of the average citizen. I don't have to do polling when I'm in and they're serving in Congress because I hear from the average citizen what's important to them, what they need to know about. They've always been well informed too. AFP has done a great job of informing these folks as to what's happening in DC, how it's affecting them. So AFP has been great over the years. Very, very uh, important during the Tea Party movement and um, I just, I've always enjoyed AFP and, and the folks who are there. And the caliber of the people has been very positive. That's fantastic. In North Carolina, even at the state level, a lot of these reforms with the tax cuts and the budget cuts over the last several years, AFP has been heavily involved in. And we were talking outside a little bit about how, you know, so often it's you've got entrenched special interests asking for bailouts and tax carve outs and this and that. But no one's really advocating for the average citizen. And I know that's something that, that you take great pride in working with AFP on. Well, I, I tell people all the time when they ask me to spend money, I think about my constituent who lives in a single wide trailer at the end of a dirt road, a single wide 40 year old trailer. Should I ask that person who's worked hard all his or her life to give more money to bail out certain special interests? No, I'm not going to do that. And, and what I like to say to people, and I love this quote by Margaret Mead, it's never doubt that a small group of thoughtful citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. But what AFP does is it brings a bunch of those small groups of determined citizens mm -hmm. together. 
And that can really change the world. And so my message to people who are involved with AFP and others that you see taking on impossible tasks, my husband always said that I'm a little ant. And I'm like that ant in high hopes, you know? Mm -hmm. What makes that little old ant think she'll move a rubber tree plant? Oops, there goes another rubber tree plant. So what I want to encourage people to do, everybody can do something. You can write a letter to the editor. You can educate your neighbors. That's what AFP basically does. It helps a citizen educate his or her neighbors about what's happening. And that's how you have a grassroots change in the country. We need it more than ever. Absolutely. One of the things AFP is doing right now is we launched a campaign called The True Cost of Washington. And folks can go to thetruecostofwashington.com. We're going to gas stations, grocery stores, bakeries, diners, um, and we're showing people the real costs of the inflation that we talked about. We're dropping the price of gas down to pre-Biden levels, seeing, you know, so people can see how much more they're paying for gas and in the process, educating them on the policies that are making their lives more expensive. So exactly what you're talking about. Again, that's the true cost of Washington.com. I want to touch on one more thing as we wrap up here, Dr. Fox. Um, in this social media age, in the age of cable television, one of the issues is that folks too often hear from the loudest voices instead of the yeah. best ones. And a lot of the times the best ones are the quietest ones doing the hard work in Congress. And so what is something that folks might not know, not maybe just about you, but even some of your colleagues as far as what really makes a difference when it comes to lawmaking and legislating in Congress versus just being, you know, an advocate for ideas on television or talk radio? Yeah. Well, legislating is hard work. It takes hundreds and hundreds of hours. Now, you don't see me on Fox News very often because I'm working in the trenches every day. It, it really is hard work to do. And even if you watch who's standing on the floor of the House, uh, speaking a lot of times. It's not a lot of the people who are out there doing the work. So I guess we need the talking heads out there stirring people up. But I hear from my citizens all the time, uh, my constituents saying, well, what about this and what about that? And then I try to explain it to them. But that's where the hard work is. It isn't in the people who are out there on the TV every night talking loudly. Uh, I, I'm glad they've cut down some of this ba bantering back and forth, which I think really offended people. But legislating takes a lot of hard work. And it's just something, it's like, uh, it's sort of like the tortoise and the hare again. Um, you just plod along till you get the work done. And uh, that's what most of us do. No, that's fantastic. And you've been doing it for many years. We've enjoyed working with you. Thank you, Akash. Thank you so much for joining us. And, and folks, hopefully this has been informative and, and enjoyable. For those of you who want to join Americans for Prosperity, as Dr. Fox mentioned, you can always go to our website, americansforprosperity.org, become an activist with us, and learn more about our campaign, The True Cost of Washington. Dot com. Dr. Fox, thank you so much thank again you, for joining Akash. us. And it's Thanks great to be here. Thanks for coming to the most beautiful part of the world. It's fantastic. Thanks, everybody.